Justin came in last minute and has to sit in the front. <laughs> my name is thrilled to be here. Uh, my name is Dan. Uh, as Kristen mentioned, I'm a, uh, I'm a deacon, uh, among other things. I'm, I'm jug my life, I'm juggling a lot of different things. And so I want to talk tonight a little bit about that, that balance. Uh, before I do, just want to thank thank Kristen. I know she's uh, gone to the St. Rayfield of Naperville Well a couple times this year, and uh, we're, we're thrilled. No, uh, no, Kristen and her parents for a very long time. It's a great family. We'll tie in well with what we're going to talk about. So, um, why, why don't we begin with prayer? Uh, so, if we get in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, it's good that we are here. Please be with us this evening as we. Share some thoughts, uh, share some stories, and hopefully uh, a lot of interaction on maintaining balance. And there's so many things going on in our lives, and oftentimes we lose sight of you uh, and don't always put you at the center of our lives. Uh, and pray that everyone here obviously does, does do that, and hopefully we can go out and be examples of what you want us to be. And uh, pray that you touch us today and every day going forward. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, life, is, life is changing at an incredible pace. And it creates a lot of stress. Does anybody know what Moore's Law is? Yes. What's Moore's Law? Uh, that computer hardware uh, every two or three years gets twice as good as it was previously. Exactly. So Warren, Warren said, every, the, the founder of, of Intel many years ago, George Moore or something like that, back in 1965, predicted that he noticed that the size of computer chips processing was doubling about every 18 months. And he predicted that that was going to go on for some period of time. Uh, and basically do it at the same cost. So the cost is coming down while speed is going up. Over the last five, ten years, the amount of, of information that has been created and that's accessible to everybody is growing absolutely exponentially. You know, we go back in time, what used to take hundreds and hundreds of years to move in a step in evolution is taking place literally every couple of years. Uh, and that's wonderful in many ways, but it's also stressful in many other ways. And it's forced a lot of people to kind of, their daily routines have kind of skewed a bit you see a lot, a lot of people not doing the things we used to do. People don't go to church as often as they used to. The, the family is not what it necessarily used to be. There's a lot of changes that are moving very quickly. So what I want to talk about uh, today is balance. You know, as we go through those, these different activities, there's a lot of demands socially. There's a lot of demands from our, our family and travel. You know, when I grew up, going to Wisconsin was a big trip. You guys have probably all been, you know, different parts of the world, and the world is smaller, and, and things just move at a much faster pace. So, I want to talk about an analogy of a, a three-legged stool, uh, which is, uh, you know, I can even use this as, a, as an example, that if a three-legged stool of being your family, your faith, and your career, that all of those need to be, you need to focus on each of them. And if you focus on any one of those too much, then the stool gets out of balance and things go badly. And there are some people that spend 100% of their time on their career. Others are, you know, it's all family and, and some, it's all faith. And the fact is, we need a little of that. And it's the faith piece, piece that's probably missing more uh, for more people than, uh, than ever before. So what I want to talk about is, is, first of all, the concept of planning. And then I've got kind of a top 10 list that uh, <coughs> I've, I've put together on, um, on how to try to balance things uh, overall. So my hope for everyone here tonight is that when you go home, that you put together, at least give some thought to what your, your life plan is. And I'm not sure if anyone here has done that, to actually sit down and put together, this is what I want to accomplish. The, um, so we're going to go through what I consider to be maybe 10, 10 points to go through that. So, number 10, number 10, number one, we'll start with number one. The, uh, I want to set the, the overall goal for your lifetime. Uh, does anyone have a goal for your life that they want to share, Christina? I really want to be a mom. You want to be a mom. It's, it's 
a great goal. It's a, it's a fabulous goal. Other other goals? Christina's the only one with a goal. <laughs> I want to write a book. You want to write a book? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So as I was just saying, if you if you fail to plan, plan to fail. So if you if you don't have a goal of where you're going, you'll never know if you get there. And being a mom is, is awesome. Uh, being a dad is awesome. Doing you know something that you've had it you know in the back of your mind forever is awesome. But I, I would argue there's even a bigger goal that we all need to uh, establish for ourselves. Uh, and and that, that number one goal is to get to heaven. Uh, we are on this planet for a nanosecond. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, what we do in the 20 years or 60 years or 100 years uh, is really a, a moment in time, but it's going to determine how we're going to spend eternity. And I don't think enough people think about that in general. So we, everything we do needs to be aimed at making sure that we get to have not just us, but our loved ones. So my, my wife and I, uh, my goal is to help her get to heaven, which is pretty easy. And uh, her goal is to, you know, work to get uh, get me there as well. And same with our kids. So, uh, you know, so number one uh, is to focus on the big prize. Uh, and as long as that is our North Star, our compass, we need to do everything to get to heaven, and we the rest is going to fall in place. So the nice thing is Jesus gave us the take-home test uh, and, and basically said there's two things that on Judgment Day we're going to be asked. Did you love God and did you love your neighbor? And so our entire life should be based on those two things. Uh, and a lot of things that, you know, if you go through that filter, a lot of things that we do every day, is this helping me love God? Is it helping me love my neighbor? And if not, it may not be the most important thing to be doing. All right, so number one is uh, set your lifetime goals. So just a, a little background on myself. I grew up in, in Mount Prospect. I'm the uh, oldest of five. I have a twin brother. We were, uh, my mom and dad were both uh, Catholic. And uh, so I've been kind of cradle Catholic, went to Mass regularly, um, but never thought of having a, any type of a vocation. I, I enjoy going to Mass, but it was never, I never felt I had the calling to be a priest or anything more than, uh, than that. Uh, and, but I did come from a great family of, of, uh, of you know, good, uh, good Christians. So I'm going to try to sprinkle in some examples as I go through my top, top ten list. Number two uh, is to set long-term goals. Uh, what do you want to accomplish before you die? So that's where being a mom, being a dad, writing a book, you know, having, you know, being, being a grandparent, or whatever it may be. I think it's one thing when you're on your, you know, the, the uh, many people have probably heard the, the, the story that to write your own eulogy. You know, what do you want someone to say about you at your funeral? And my guess is they're not going to say, she was a great nurse. He was a great accountant. She did, he was a, you know, they're going to say he was, great dad, she was a great friend, she helped others. It's going to be the, the, the charitable angle uh, that will be most important. And I always try to think about as career opportunities come up, do I want to chase that and am I going to be sacrificing anything else? So so you want to go ahead and set set your long-term goals. I, uh, so I, I went to uh, University of Illinois I graduated in accounting. I went to go work for a big uh, accounting firm. And at the time, I wasn't focused on faith. Faith part of my uh, my three-legged stool was, was fine. It wasn't real strong. It wasn't one I was exercising. And I was focused on my career. So I went into the at KPMG, and my goal was to make partner and to uh, be able to retire when I'm 50 so I could spend the second half of my life Helping others. The, uh, I have a, a grandfather that lived to be 105. I have two grandmothers that lived to be 95. So I think I've, I've got to start saving. And, uh, 
the, uh, so I, I, I figure, all right, I've got 50 years to get what I need, and then I've got another 50 to do some really cool things. So, so even after college, I did set my long-term goals for, for my life, things that I wanted to accomplish, and that plan really has not deviated a whole lot. There have been a couple of speed bumps and minor turns, but it's still been uh, relatively straight. So, uh, number two is set long-term goals. Number three is select friends and a spouse who will make you a better person. Uh, the, uh, many of you have uh, probably heard that you've become the best version of yourself. Matthew Kelly, who's uh, a Chicago Catholic writer, and he talks about we're all given certain gifts, and we all want to make the best of what we have. And we're all giving, certain, you know, have certain uh, shortcomings as well. So when you Select your friends, select your spouse in particular. You want to find someone who's really going to push you to be the best. And not every person does that. Some people are a little uncomfortable with that, but I was, uh, I was fortunate. I married up uh, in life, as, as fortunately many people that don't need family have. We just continue to <laughs> raise, raise the standard, and, and my wife has been the greatest gift to me. So I met her at KPMG. It was the greatest thing I took away from that job, of course, <laughs> my wife. <laughs> And, uh, and I, knew, I knew after our first date that, that she was the one. And so we'll get into uh, you know, one of the other goals here is to take you know, educated risks. And I, I, I didn't waste any time. So we were, <laughs> we were engaged after six months. And uh, it's been just the best decision I ever made. The, uh, so initially focusing on, on career out of college, but then kind of quickly moving towards the family side of things. Uh, shortly, a couple years after we were married, we had our, our first uh, child, our son, uh, John, and then a couple years later we had our daughter, Kate. Uh, and uh, it was interesting. So our, my, our, our goal of money kind of quickly moved to the back because my wife was working full-time, then she was working part-time, and then she wasn't working at all, and then the uh, things changed with me, and, and so for like three or four years, our revenue was going down, our expenses were going up. Uh, but we never really considered, uh, you know, changing our plan to to make more money. We just kind of stayed the course, and uh, you know, the, the kids were always uh, number number one. So, so number three is select friends and a spouse that will will. Uh, help you become the best version of yourself. Number four is always make family your top priority, no matter where you are. A few years ago, I entered the, the diaconate program. It's a five-year program, and they, they tell us that our priority is always, number one, going to be family. If we have a family conflict, our kids have something, if something's going on, we can miss the, you know, whatever we have, because that is more important. Uh, in fact, as you're able to plan, you can move, move that around, but uh, family will always be first. The, um, you know, the, I, I try to make as many, you know, I probably made two-thirds of the kids' games. Uh, you know, their times and career is just going to get in the way. You're going to have peaks and valleys where on the, the three legs, career is going to, you're going to have times where you're just going to have to make some sacrifices, and then other times you make sacrifices for work family. So I, I did attend most of the, uh, their, their events. I, I you know, helped coach and played other things. And I never wanted to go home and regret that the kids are gone and I wish I would have done something. So when you sit down and put together those goals, that family always has to be the top priority. So growing up, I, from the time they were about 10, we went on a, on a father-son weekend and a father-daughter weekend. So in, in addition to Everything we had going on, that was kind of our two days. Wherever they wanted to go, in the country we would go. Uh, and we had to go to church. We had to, you know, uh, spend a lot of time uh, with each other. So, so the family was always a, uh, was always the best. And that's, that's ultimately what I'm going to be the most proud of at the end of the day. As Kat said, the, the, you know, only a good tree can bear good fruit. And if you look at a child, they're a reflection of the parents, and you want to uh, focus on that. All right, so number five, uh, select a career that you love uh, and recognize that it will periodically call for sacrifice. So many jobs are very demanding, and there are times that you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to uh, 
travel, you're going to have to miss certain things. But it has to be a good job. It has to be one that is morally aligned uh, with what you do. Uh, I know some people that all they focus on is their job. Uh, they will work 60, 70, 80 hours. I'm sure you have friends like that as well. And their life is out of balance. Uh, there may be periods of time where you have that. But chances are, if they're expecting that all the time, you may be in the, in the wrong spot. It's forcing you to change your uh, your moral code uh, that something is, is very wrong. The, uh, so, number five, uh, find a job that you love. Uh, number six, just like selecting a spouse and friends, find, select a company that embraces your moral values. And when you find it, don't be afraid to let others know about your faith. A lot of, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about bringing a statue of Mary or, you know, uh, big posters in or, you know, praying out loud. People know who the faith-filled individuals are at their company. It may be something as small as going to Mass early on Ash Wednesday and coming into work and, and people asking, you know, I didn't know you were Catholic, and it's an opportunity to have that discussion. I never was afraid to talk about, you know, people ask, you know, most people, act, you know, when, they, when, when talking about God or religion, most people have that curiosity and want to know, and, and having those discussions at work, some people would just avoid it completely. Uh, I never did. I found it was, you know, that there's a, a need. I didn't wear it on my sleeve, but people uh, often know that, look, I've got a problem at home. Can, can I talk to you about that? So being a good listener, being a good example uh, is most, uh, most important. The, um, so, maybe going back to my life, I, I was at KPMG for 17 years. I uh, was, uh, did make partner, I was a partner for seven years there and an opportunity came up to move to another company called Race Holdings. Uh, this is, uh, it's the largest family owned business in Illinois, it's one of the lar largest in the, one of the top ten in the country. Uh, we're the largest beer distributor uh, in, the, uh, in the country, we're the largest, we distribute to half the restaurants in McDonald's uh, around the world. Uh, we, uh, and I'm now, so I was CFO there for 17 years, and then uh, the last couple of years I've been focusing on a Coca-Cola uh, business. It's a great company. Uh, the reason I left and went there, it's, it's a, uh, you know, very well run, but you can tell they're, they're good people and they would never ask you to do anything inappropriate. Uh, and sometimes you don't see that when you start a company, you don't realize until you're there. At that point, you, you may need to make a, uh, make a change. So as I am working through, the kids are getting older, I began to focus more on the faith side uh, of, uh, of my life. My wife is now, you know, she's helped, helped the kids. When they got a little bit older, she began volunteering at church more often and got me involved in some of the religious ed. I helped, uh, Kristen was in our, our high school confirmation class and began starting to get the pull to spend a little bit more time on the faith side of my, uh, my three-legged stool. So I began doing a little less at work, a little bit more at church, uh, and involving the, the family with that. So you want to find a company where you can have some of that flexibility as well. So number seven, you have to treat your faith like a, like a muscle. We go out and we work out, hopefully we work out <laughs> regularly. So we don't go regularly. The, uh, but faith is a muscle. If you don't focus on it, it, it can get weak. Uh, we need to be working that, trying to get smarter, understand what we're, what our faith is, what the Bible says, what our, what our Catholic beliefs are. And so it's a muscle you need to work. So it starts with a you know, daily routine of, of prayer every day. Hopefully we're going to Mass every week. Ideally if you can get there more often. Uh, but the more you get into it, the more you get out of it. Uh, and at your age, it's, but the fact that you're here tonight puts you at the absolute pinnacle of your, uh, you know, your peers. So you're working the muscles. A lot, a lot of people are not. Please don't ever stop because it's, it will be a source of strength when tough times come. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of people just don't have that fiber anymore. And it's tough for them to get into it. So always uh, keep, uh, keep working, uh, working out the faith. The, um, so when I was at, at Ray's, I began working with a group of, um, 
other business leaders, and we got together with a couple Catholic priests, and once a month we would have a uh, an evening where we would focus on it's kind of Bible study, but more talking about current events, what's happening in the world. How do we bring our Christian values into the workplace? And it was very fulfilling and very rewarding uh, to do that. In fact, uh, um, I don't know how many Cub fans we have? Any, any Cub fans here tonight? The uh, Tom Ricketts was one of the, the first guys to, to jump in this group, and he he is a very very faith very faith oriented uh, businessman. Uh, and in fact, I think that the primary reason for the Cubs turnaround is he came in there and he cleared out a lot of the problems that they had in the clubhouse. And so we've got because I asked him what uh, you know, six months into it, what were the biggest surprises? He said we got a lot of bad dudes on this on this team. And so he helped to you know, move the Sorianos and the others out and bring in some really good guys that work together as a team. He has a, a priest from, uh, from our diocese who uh, is the chaplain for the Cubs. So he's, uh, and Joe Madden you know, says, look, when you have a priest walking around uh, these ball players, they just act a little bit more grown up. <laughs> and so, you know, Father Burke will walk into the locker room and guys will be cracking jokes and, and saying stuff and suddenly they, they tone down. And they, uh, they, they're a little bit more focused. So having that faith element uh, throughout your life and bringing it into the business place can be very, uh, very uplifting. The... Um, so at this point, I started to begin feeling there was another call, um, and I thought I was being called to the, the deaconate. Uh, I think that the we all need to, we all know we have a shortage of, of priests, uh, and uh, and the commitments that priests make are unbelievable. Uh, and I think it's up to all of us to step up and help where we can. We have the greatest church in the world. Uh, and we have just a handful of shepherds that uh, have too big of a flock. So it began to have the call. And the way the diaconate program works is you, you go through a, a discernment process, you, you sign up, and then, you know, half of the, the men that sign up uh, are not asked to continue right out of the box. And it also involves our your spouse. So my wife had to attend all the classes for five years. She had to sign off on everything. And up until the time I was ordained, she could have said no. Uh, and actually, uh, Anne was not certain that she was she wanted to be a deacon's wife. Uh, you know, she just thought she wasn't worthy, uh, which is a bit logical. <laughs> the, uh, so began to go through the diaconate process five years uh, have been ordained. So now I'm balancing my Coca-Cola world at Grace Holdings and I'm balancing my deaconate world. And it's at the point now where I I don't want to spend as much time on the professional side. I'm, I'm at my a little over my 50 year point. My my goal I, I want to retire and start spending more time with the church and it's been completely rewarding. So number seven is treat your faith like a muscle. Number eight is um, give to others. Uh, as uh, you know, Jesus uh, told us we're all given talents. Some are given more talents than others. Uh, but those that use their talents well are given more, and those that don't use them, even if they have only a few, can lose them. So the expectation is we're going to use those talents for the best, the betterment of others. Uh, so giving to charity uh, has to be part of all of our goals in that, in that balance. And anyone that's given, you, you take more uh, than you give when you do so. But the rewards always come back. I used to do the uh, taxes for my grandfather. As I say, it looked to be 105. Every other check he had, $5 to Maryville Orphanage, $5 to the church, $5 to whatever. And I said, Grandpa, you, you, know, you don't have that much money. Uh, so you sure you want to be giving it to all these charities, being the real cold accountant that I was. <laughs> and uh, and he, he said, Danny, you will never go broke giving your money away. And I totally believe that, that for every dollar you give, ten dollars will find their way back. And so giving of your, of your uh, 
goods is important, but giving of your time is also important. A lot of folks here do not have, you may not have a lot of excess resources. You have student loans, you have you know, rent, you've got a lot of other things, but you may have time. And everyone's got a few hours a month that you can go and help someone else. And so I would encourage you uh, at this point to begin helping others. And again, I, you, you're more inclined to do that because you're here tonight. Uh, but, uh, but charity is always going to be, uh, be important. So about five years ago, I was uh, helping out at, at Special Olympics. And uh, a concept, uh, you start to think of a, of a business aimed at helping charities. And so a few years ago, um, my son and I started a company that we call Charity Fish. And it's a short for charity efficient. The charity is not that easy, and we think it needs to be much easier. Using some of the technology that's available, finding ways to inspire people to go and give them their time and talents. In fact, Austin uh, is, uh, is was an intern with us a couple years ago, and now he's a full-time employee. And, um, and part of what we do at Cherry Fish is every employee is expected to volunteer every you know, three or four hours every couple of weeks. And it may be, may be at the church, it may be helping underprivileged, it may be at an animal shelter, uh, but it's, it's part of our core culture of, of giving back. And it, it's something that the, that the church has embraced from day one. Uh, last week I gave a, a homily on... Uh, and it was basically that the first reading was from, from the Acts, where the, the new apostles were building the church and they were having a struggle. There were some widows that were not being uh, fed and they debated, should we help these widows or do we focus on spreading the gospel? And they said, we need to do both. And that's when they established the deacon. You know, they appointed seven men as deacons to go out and focus on serving others. So we've got priests focusing on the liturgy, uh, and the deacons focusing on, on serving. Uh, and uh, so giving to others should be critical to anyone's life goals. Number nine is, uh, is to take, take risks. We can go and try to live a simple, straightforward, risk-free life, uh, and you know, there's a risk-reward balance there. We all need to take some chance and trust your gut. And I got engaged six months after I, you know, my first date. And that was probably three months after I wanted to, and probably, <laughs> probably two years before my wife was ready for it, but figured, we're going to go and take that risk. When I was in public accounting, I was a partner, and partners just don't leave because things are good, but I, thought, I knew this role at, at Race Holdings was going to be better. When I was at Race Holdings, I knew the diaconate was going to be better, and I know the cherry fish is going to be better. So a lot of these are educated risks. And sometimes we need to go and, and take a leap into some deep waters that you may be uncomfortable with, but if you pray over it and trust that God is with you the whole time, I know that He's, he's guiding us, that you should have that faith to go and, uh, and take that. And some people are just afraid to make those, those calls, but I would highly encourage that that be part of your lifetime goals. So the, uh, the, the tenth item I have uh, is to retreat annually and update your plan. So every year I, I sit down and, and take a, a, some hours and put together, this is my, what I want to, a daily routine I want to have. And the daily is usually focused on, on prayer and reflection that I need to make sure I do. There are certain things I want to do weekly basis, monthly basis, but then what I want to get done by the end of the year, at the end of five years, and the end of 20 years. And so I can tell you, I've got a pretty good idea where I'm going to be, uh, you know, 20 years from now and 40 years from now because I'm starting to lay that groundwork. And I would recommend that you all do the same. What's our plan to get to heaven? What's our plan to be a grandmother? What's our plan to help, you know, make the world a better place? And if you put that in writing, the, the odds of that happening have gone up about 500%. Very few people take that time to put, put it in writing and then they just kind of go through day by day and have some sense of where they want to get to. But I would highly recommend uh, that you take time to retreat, give thanks, ask God for, uh, for some guidance, and then just go do it. So that's my uh, quick top ten list. 
always keep keep in mind the, the, the three legs. We, we need to have a career of some sort. We need to be supporting someone that has that career. We need to focus on our, our family, and we need to take care of, of number one, uh, which is God. So um, that's kind of my quick uh, summary of, uh, of how I got here. And, worked for me. It may or may not work for you. I hope, hope it does. The, uh, and it really wasn't meant to be about me so much as a thought of let's, let's focus on what we need to do to get to heaven and do a little bit on, on that every day. So um, with that, I know where, where we are on, on time. Are we good? Yeah, we can, we can do any yeah. questions. Or any, any thoughts or questions? I got one. Um, so, it sounds like at this point in your life you have a lot of control over how you make the balance of these three things in your life, um, but I would presume that when you first started at your job you didn't have as much control over what your bosses were telling you what to do, yeah. and I'm wondering if you could talk about how you managed if you felt your balance was out of whack, but your bosses had a different vision of what your balance should be, <laughs> how you manage that. So Warren asked, he said, as soon as I have a lot of control over things now in my life, and uh, if I have given that impression, <laughs> it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it is out of control, <laughs> but in a good way, and it's funny because everything seems to work out. So I'm trying to spend two or three days a week at church. Uh, I have... Tomorrow, and I'll just give you an example. So tomorrow, I, I'm, I have a communion service for a senior home out in Naperville. It's every other Friday I go out there. Well, my co with the Coca-Cola side, we just announced on Tuesday that we're buying all the Coca-Cola business in California, Nevada, and, and I, I have to lead that. So I had to immediately go out, meet our, our, our new employees, and I have a meeting with our owners tomorrow. Let's get together at, uh, at 9 o'clock to go over everything you found. And I said, I won't, I will not be there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm going to be serving communion to 15 women and men that may not even know I'm there. <laughs> and, but that, that is more important. And, and so part of it is just being able to say, you know what, I'm not going to be the greatest employee uh, at this point in time, and and I had to give up some diaconate things earlier in the week to fly out to California. I had to miss some stuff I found. So you, it's it's a juggling act. But I do I, I look back at times and I'm I'm in awe as to how often things fit in so nicely because I know my guardian angel uh, is helping to manage my schedule. Uh, but I do have a little bit more more control now. Early on, there are times where you, you you just don't have that same flexibility, and uh, you know, with your job, and and that's where you need a spouse, uh, if you have a spouse that, that understands that there are going to be times that are, you're you're just not going to be, it's not going to be ideal, and again, you just kind of have to keep that big picture that in, in play that everyone's going to have to sacrifice at some point in time. But always, and if something perpetually gets out of out of bounds and you can't control it, it may be the wrong. You may be in the wrong place for a little bit. That answer your question. But yeah, I think it does get easier, but it's it's never that easy. First of all, thank you so much. I really appreciate your list. Um, how do you balance all three when one of them is not like physically with you? Um. When one is not physically with me? Like, if you have to travel for work all the time, yeah. or you live alone and your family's yeah. in a different state? Yeah. Well, uh, good question. The, uh, a lot of it, you know, when I'm traveling, I, you know, I, actually when I travel, it's kind of interesting, I, I, I try to find a, a church. If I'm going to be there more than a few days, I will try to find a church there, or I'll at least be able to go and pray by myself. The uh, certainly reaching out and connecting with my wife and kids. I mean, that's one of the benefits of FaceTime and, and everything else. That even if you're not touching someone, you can still feel like you're with them. 
but it, it takes work. And, and that's where, you know, I have planning your day, I sit down the first thing of the day is to lay out what am I doing in each of these three buckets to make sure I'm, I'm advancing the ball positively. Uh, and it's, it becomes part of your job. Uh, and, and I realized if I've been gone for three or four days, I need to, I, I need to go, go on a date night with my wife because she's been managing the store. Uh, and if, uh, if I haven't been at work for a period of time, I you know, need to look, look out on a week or so. It's, uh, again, it's, it's a juggling act. They start out general and then they get specific. And, and it's interesting because I've kept every one of these for the last 25 years and I, and I look at them and they've moved from more material goals to more faith goals. You know, I want to, I want to have a house, I want to pay off the mortgage, I want to be able to put enough money away for the kids. So there's a lot of money focus and some of it was I want to get it. 10% raise this year, or I want to do what I need to do to be able to take the family on a trip to wherever. So some of them are, you know, the, usually the, the whatever's in the, first, in the next year is certainly going to be very specific. In the next five years may be pretty specific. I, mean, I want to get, get this promotion, I want to get into the Diagnostic program. But then longer term, they're very general. You know, I, I, I'd like to be a grandfather, but I, that's kind of out of my control. <laughs> <laughs> My wife just says, just be patient. <laughs> Leave the kids alone. The, uh, uh, but it, it, even then, you know, so I wanted to retire at 50. I'm now 55, and I haven't checked that one off. I, I'm trying, but uh, there's a reason I, I'm still doing some other things. So the short term is certainly specific. Very short term, it can be very specific. Um, so you've been talking about the three-legged school the whole time, the work, yep. the career. Um, you also mentioned your wife worked part-time and then was a full-time mother yep. for a while. So how did you, I mean, this is obviously making more her if she was here, yep. but how was it for her to kind of only have two of those legs for at least a time period? Well, um, I, I think her career was, the, was our family. Well, I guess the two will be the same. Yeah, and, the, and that of her career at that point was more important than mine. Mine, mine was providing money for the you know, electricity and the food, which is not unimportant. But the, uh, so she made a big sacrifice to, to you know, really make sure our kids were safe and secure. The, but after the, the kids were in college, she, she went back and is now, she was an accountant for a few years and now she's a, a Pilates trainer. And she's fabulous. If any of you need to work on the core, like <laughs> if you're in Naperville, I would highly recommend. And she's doing what she's truly passionate about. She spends time. She uh, you know, she goes to the hospital and, and uh, gives communion. So her faith journey. And there's actually a point I was very nervous that she was. I'd come home from work. And she was in a Bible study and she's highlighting and doing all kinds of things. And and I thought, boy, she is. She is so far beyond me that. I'm, I, I thought I was, you know, this is going to be a separation. And I really thought that I, I'm losing a connection. I either need to catch up or slow her down. And I uh, figured it's probably up to me to do a little bit of work. And, and that, again, helped kind of push me. So she's, I, she's always had the freedom to kind of, you know, map out her own plan, which she doesn't write down. So I, I can sit and preach about writing a, you know, an annual plan or a lifetime plan, and she she's more living in the moment. And uh, but she's always said, I'm, I'm glad you had the plan because I like where we're at. So so one of us needs to have the plan, and one of us needs to have the heart. <laughs> so so what's kind of like your daily routine? Uh, it's really got a lot going on. So kind of yeah, make us through it or like tips for us to like. All right, so my, my daily routine, I, I usually get up quarter to five. In the, uh, so as a deacon, we have to, every ordained um, person in the world has to say morning prayers and evening prayers. So I go through my morning prayers. I, I typically 
So I'm driving into the office, we'll listen to, uh, on Sirius XM, the, the Catholic channel, I'll listen to uh, church you know, mass from um, St. Patrick's in New York. So I have already you know, read, read whatever the readings are for the day and reflected on those, but then I like hearing the homily from Cardinal Dole and from someone else. And so I'm in the office by, typically, if I'm going to the office, whether it's Cherry Fish or uh, Grace Holdings, I'm usually there by 6.30, and I put together, the first thing I do is I put together my plan for the day, and it's usually one of the top 10 things I want to get done, and, uh, and it includes a little of everything. You know, have I connected with my family, with my kids, with, you know, every, every Friday I go around the horn and call my mother, call my twin brother, and my three sisters, and I can't remember the time any one of them called me, so uh, I almost think if I didn't take the time to call, and it's a ritual now, and they, they know that we're going to talk at 4.30 on Friday. The, uh, so I feel like I've kind of taken the lead on some of these, but I, I, I just wonder would they have done anything or would I have done anything? Would we ever see each other if I didn't do this? So my place, I map it out, and, and I also look at the, you know, the week. So I typically have a couple of evenings where I'm doing faith-oriented things, couple evenings where I'm with my wife or kids, uh, and then uh, sometime where I just, you know, need to do it myself. My wife and I go, we walk religiously. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get our 12,000 steps in every day, so I'll, I'll get home tonight and we'll, <coughs> we'll let them go walk around Fawn Lake or, or do something. Uh, and that is the other, probably the fourth leg is you got to take care of yourself and, uh, and your body, but it's so when I, the only time I ever get stressed out is when things keep popping in my mind that I, I forgot about that I need to do. And I've got, I've got a to-do list with everything on it. I know if it's on that list, I'm going to look at it, I'm going to deal with it, and uh, the, the stress level goes down. And then I also have a glass of wine at night, too. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if you'd be able to talk through it. Sounds like you had discerned some large calculated risks. I think of how you dis described it. Yeah. Just sort of in your life, how you came to to take those risks, and you knew that that was where the Lord was calling you. You know, I I, I can't. You know, when I look back, the uh, I, I think a lot of I've just been very lucky. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I give credit to my guardian angel. I applied to one university. You know, when I went to college, I said, well, I'm going to go to Illinois. And if I didn't get in there, I, I didn't have a backup plan. <laughs> the, uh, and so I looked at these, and I went in with complete confidence that, well, of course this is going to happen. And so there have been very few things I've looked back and, and regretted. And, you know, I remember we, the first time my wife and I bought a house, but, uh, you know, we bought it, and, and she couldn't sleep for two or three days. She goes, we, do we do the right thing? And again, it was a small house. We weren't, you know, but for us, it, you know, we felt like we were financially over, totally over our skis. But I just felt that, look, we've, we're going to get there. And, and so there's, there's certainly going to be points, there's going to be things you can't control. When you're sick, when your spouse is sick or your kids are sick, that's something that wasn't in the plan. And, and that's really the only part that I, I have a difficult time dealing with is when my kids are in pain or something bad happened to them. Uh, you know, you could 